let's uh, let's talk about mischaracterizing inventions. Um, previously, we talked about sort of your standard issue, uh, broadest reasonable interpretation. So the examiner looked at your claims and they used the broadest reasonable interpretation rule to argue that they were to something that they weren't. Um, and we talked about how you may or may not want to uh, respond to that. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, three sort of different ways of claim mischaracterization. So let's go with the first one. Um, this is uh, application 15, 637, 537. And at first, this one appears to be very similar to what we talked about last time, which is sort of broadest reasonable interpretation rule. So the Applicant argues the office action grossly mischaracterizes the claims by asserting that the term network proxy encompasses a human being. So the applicant is uh, uh, not particularly thrilled with this, uh, points out an entry for the word proxy from the Merriam-Webster dictionary is cited. So the examiner uh, used the broadest reasonable interpretation rule um, and... They said, well, there are some kinds of proxies that are human, therefore a network proxy is human. Uh, the applicant is having none of this, uh, obviously. They make some arguments saying, no, it's unreasonable to assert that a network proxy um, is referencing a deputy who acts as a substitute for another. Uh, I would argue that even if you did, it's it's a network. It, it's acting for as a substitute for a network, and a person can't be like a substitute for a computer network. Um, in any case... Why am I bringing this up when we're not talking about necessarily broadest reasonable interpretation? Well, the reason is this is an example of what I will call the subsidiary mischaracterization. So this is only talking about a dependent claim. Um, the network proxy was not in the independent claims. The independent claims, the applicant made many arguments. This was in the context of Section 101. And the applicant made many arguments about technical effect and practical applications. And ultimately, um, the uh, all of the 101s were withdrawn based on the arguments made on the independent claims about technical improvements um, being accomplished by the invention. And so the reason I think this is a little bit different from your standard broadest reasonable interpretation is because it shows that sometimes um, your mischaracterizations are not the real point, right? They are something where the examiner says, look, overall, this is not allowable, for example, because they think it's, uh, you know, that the main invention is directed to an abstract idea. And rather than necessarily saying, hey, wait a minute, network proxies clearly are not abstract, they'll say, oh, I'm going to ignore these network proxies, not because they think they're not abstract, or not because they think they are abstract, rather, but because they don't want to let anything through. And it's easier to say that a network proxy is talking about a human than it is to argue that it's abstract. Uh, and therefore, in this case, what what ultimately happened was not the arguments on broadest reasonable, reasonable interpretation that won, it was arguments on the real issue, the independent claims. And this is something that I often find in my practice also is I'll go to a interview and it might look like there are a whole lot of naughty issues, a whole lot of kind of difficult to deal with problems. Um, but once we talk things through, it turns out there's maybe one, maybe two issues. Once we resolve those, the other ones sort of magically disappear. And I think this is a good example of how that can happen with the mischaracterization of the invention. So that's the first sort of alternative is the ancillary issue, or maybe you, you might even call it the mischaracterization misdirection. Um, but that's not the only one that I want to talk to. Uh, so this one is, uh, this is application 15924069. And this one uh, looks like it is uh, frustrating. So the examiner grossly mischaracterizes, again, I'm reading from the uh, remarks, the examiner grossly mischaracterizes the claims in alleging they are directed to a series of steps for matching orders at an auction. To be sure, there are no steps involving any aspect of an auction in the claims. Moreover, the word auction does not appear in the claims or the specification. While the examiner is allowed to use broadest reasonable interpretation, it cannot be stressed enough this interpretation must be both reasonable and consistent with the specification. So, what is this? Is this broadest reasonable interpretation? I would argue no. Uh, 
Um, as the applicant points out, you know, we're not actually talking about an auction anywhere in here. We don't talk about it in the claims, we don't talk about it in the specification. This kind of a characterization is something I would think of as kind of a gestalt characterization, right? You're not saying, oh, this word needs to be interpreted this way, this word needs to be interpreted this way. You're saying uh, this whole sort of invention, I as the examiner, when I read through this, I get the impression this is about an auction, um, and therefore uh, I'm going to treat it as, I'm going to reject it under Section 101. In my experience, these can be some of the hardest mischaracterization uh, rejections to deal with. And the reason is because unless you fundamentally change the nature of your claims by making some very significant amendment, the examiner is going to continue with their sort of gestalt level understanding of what it is. They'll say, ah, eh, nah, it's still an auction. You make this change because it's not really tied to any specific claim language. It's tied to their impression of it. And that impression can be very difficult to dispel. Um, and in fact, that's ultimately what happened in this case. So the applicant uh, was able to get by this, but what they ended up needing to do was make very significant amendments, adding some hardware elements into the independent claims. Uh, I may not go that route. Um, but, but when I haven't gone that route and I've dealt with these sort of gestalt level mischaracterizations, um, I've often had to uh, go to an appeal board um, because, as I said, it can be very difficult to get the examiner to um, reconsider uh, their position because, you know, they look at it and again, it's not necessarily tied to specific claim language and so changing specific claim language or arguing about specific limitations can be very difficult to, to succeed with. And finally, and this is the one that I think is the most interesting kind of mischaracterization. So this is um, a mischaracterization of the disclosure of the invention. So we've been talking about the claims, right? The name of the game is the claim. Uh, this one is from application 17039759, and this is one where there is a 112 written description rejection. And what the applicant says is um, the office action opines uh, that the applicants do not describe any transgenic plant other than soybean expressing any fusion protein comprising K casein or B lactoglobulin, except for ones from cattle. Um, this is false. The applicants describe numerous host cell expression systems, including several from monocotyledonous plants and dicotyledonous plants. Further, applicants describe a voluminous amount of unstructured proteins, which include 16 K caseins from a wide assortment of animals, and then cites you know, various uh, portions of the specification as well as the arguments that they make in the uh, office action. So this is an interesting problem. Um, because you can't really solve this by, at least by amending your uh, uh, claims, or, or let me rephrase that. You can, but what you need to do is limit your claims in a way that you don't think is appropriate. Uh, the other alternative is to show that the examiner is wrong when he or she um, has characterized the invention as described in the specification. This is another difficult one to deal with. Uh, not, in my opinion, as hard as the gestalt level, but also difficult because any amendment you make to the specification to try and clarify something, um, you run a risk of new matter, and so you can't really do that. So what are you going to be limited to? Well, one way is limiting the claims. As I'd mentioned, you can limit the claims to what the examiner agrees is in the specification. You may not want to do that, but that's one option. Another option is what they're doing here, wherein they say, look, you are wrong, examiner. Here are all these different arguments and different portions of the specification, which in fact should be understood as disclosing the stuff that you say is not disclosed. All right. Uh, the third way, and this is actually what I have done um, when I've run into this, is I will bring in extrinsic evidence. And the way I'll do this is by way of a declaration. And I'll say, look, you say that this is not disclosing whatever it is that I needed to disclose. Um, but here is some external uh, validated source. So maybe it's going to be a textbook. Uh, maybe it's going to be a uh, inventor with a great deal of um, knowledge, you know, very good credentials. Uh, maybe if they're say, it'll be something like uh, um, an advertisement to show that something, you know, was already widespread. So you don't need to disclose how to do something that was already sort of well known in the art. Um, 
but I'll bring it, try and bring in some of these external items. And the reason I think this is a very appropriate thing to do, and it's my preferred approach with these, um, I can say, look, uh, here it is in the disclosure. And maybe I'll have an, uh, an interview and the examiner will say, oh, you're right, I, this is right. You know, just put this in, this, in the uh, remarks and, and I'll withdraw it. And if that's the case, great. Um, but oftentimes examiners will say, no, I actually read your disclosure, as I should, and I don't think this is that. So just pointing to it doesn't really get you where you need to go. Now you could sort of play a game of a patent prosecution chicken, right? And go that way anyway. But if you bring in something external that says, all right, you examiner don't interpret it this way, but one of skill in the art clearly would, um, that makes it kind of harder for them. And if you are going to play that game of chicken, it sets you up better for an appeal if you need to go that route. Uh, in this case, um, as I said, they went the route of pointing to where things uh, were in the specification that they thought covered what the examiner said wasn't there. Uh, this was not successful, and ultimately they did end up limiting this um, by limiting their independent claims to something that was close to what the examiner said uh, was, was disclosed. So, in any case, uh, that's three more ways that you can have your invention mischaracterized. There is the uh, misdirection mischaracterization, the gestalt mischaracterization, and then the disclosure mischaracterization. Uh, all three of them can potentially be difficult, but... Um, as, uh, as we've discussed, there are ways to respond to all three and ultimately to uh, get over them, um, at least in most cases, though they can be a little bit difficult. All right, that's it. I appreciate your time. Uh, good luck, uh, good patents, and I hope you never have to deal with a mischaracterization ref rejection of broadest reasonable interpretation or any other variety. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.